So again, Stephen, thanks very much for taking the time to do this here. Uh, your Pleasure. name was always synonymous growing up with records. I was buying, I was buying records. The first, the first uh, time I was aware of who you were was when I bought Lazar by Blur. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then all these great records I kept buying. Your name was, you know, in the credits, Stephen Street. So, you know, I always knew the record was going to be quality, even if I hadn't heard of the band. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say so. You know, so... And first of all, I'd like to say congratulations. Last year, you won the Outstanding Contribution to UK Music Prize uh, by the Music yeah. Producers Guild. How, how did that feel? It felt great, although it kind of, it was very kind of quickly kind of forgotten about what with all the COVID kind of <laughs> lockdown yeah. and everything. It kind of, it was the last hurrah. When I, when I think back to that night in February, you know, I think it was late February, where we were all kind of squashed in that kind of conference room in somewhere in London for the, for the uh, award ceremony. God knows how much uh, COVID was flying around, yeah. around the room there. Thank God, touch wood. I didn't actually catch it. I saw it happen. Uh, but uh, it was uh, it was it it was like it was probably the last big kind of big night out that I had before everything kind of changed forever, really. Uh, but it was nice to be recognised. I must admit, it was. Um, you know, you do worry about sometimes when you get an award like that, uh, as if it's your kind of golden watch moment where they're kind of shocking you off to the individual yeah. <laughs> moment but hopefully that's not the case yeah. um but uh no, it was nice to be recognized by my kind of fellow peers as it were in the industry and mm -hmm. uh i'm just I, I, I'm, I'm very proud of what we do in this country i think you know we we are great at creating music that we can sell to the world and to be part of that very successful industry i think is something that i really I, I'm very proud of, and it's nice to celebrate it occasionally. Yeah, well deserved. So, look, going back to the start, how did you become a music producer? Well, basically, I was I, I was a musician in the band, and I'd done some recording, and I and I I, I really enjoyed that. And but the band I was in, though, we weren't. Although we had a record contract, we weren't doing that great. And and um, I decided that. Um, that rather than pursuing the idea of being a bass player in the band, I'd like to try and take a kind of right hand turn. And at that time, in this is like at the end of the well, yeah, early 80s, mm -hmm. right at the very beginning of the early 80s, end of the 70s, there were a lot of what I call engineer producers. I'm talking of the likes of like Martin Hannett, Martin mm -hmm. Russian, Steve Lillywhite, Chris Thomas, John Leckie. They were uh, engineers who were working with a lot of the kind of punk and post-punk you know kind of bands that were around at the time and it was obvious that the progression in production in the 80s was going to come through technology you know with the with the advent of drum machines and, mm -hmm. and all the new kind of you know uh, uh, digital reverbs and so on that were coming on, online at that time so I thought if I, I'd like to become a record producer, but if I want to do that, I think I should learn how to do record engineering. So I basically wrote to all the studios I could possibly think of and asked for a job. And, um, you know, most of them I didn't hear back from at all. But finally, uh, cut the story down short, I did hear about a job going at Island Records. And I managed to talk my way into getting a job there because they had, they had a, Island Records had a, uh, a studio in the basement of the actual mm -hmm. main record company building. And that's where I started. So I started as an assistant engineer uh, at Ireland. And uh, I was there for uh, like two or three years. And that's when I met the, uh, I had the good fortune to run into the Smiths. Yeah, we'll get to them later on. Um, yeah. But I'd like, is it, I, I didn't know this here, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, the first album you produced was Stephen 1010 Duffy album. Was that correct? I think so. That was the first one where I got a full production credit. Yeah. Uh, so I was work, when I worked with the Smiths, originally I was just kind of, you know, I say just, but I was the engineer working with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and bit by bit, I kind of, I went up the ladder with them, you know, I got a co-production credit, you know, later on and so on. But um, I was working at Island Studios and, and uh, yeah, I can't remember exactly how it came about that I started working with Stephen. But I, I met him and I thought he was really impressive as a songwriter. Uh, you know, he was doing kind of very pop type music at that point initially as, as his Tintin Duffy phase. But but still, it was, it was really evident that he, he was, there was more to him than that, you know. And yeah, I think you're quite correct. Yeah, that might well be the first album that I actually got a production credit on. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember the tra- uh, icing on the cake and yeah. Kiss Me. We're such, yeah. such, such heavy staples on the radio around about that yeah. time. And, and, and that kind of gets back to what I was saying about early on, you know, it was very reliant on that kind of 80s type production back then, you know, big drum yeah. machines and, you know, synthesizer stabs and you know it was really kind of that, that really is of its time whereas obviously the smiths is very different but uh, yeah it was, it was really good fun working on that it was quite a contrast to the smith stuff i was doing mm-hmm. and um and as i said steven's an intelligent songwriter so i didn't feel any kind of uh, kind of uncomfortable feeling of working on, on, on with a pop kind of artist as it were mm-hmm. it felt quite natural what makes you say yes to a producing job the producer band I've got to like it. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I'm, well, especially now, I'm fortunate enough that I don't have to, and I don't want to take on things just to fill the diary, you know, or fill, fill the calendar up. Uh, I, I find that if you work on something you don't really feel uh, an affinity with, you won't do a good job on it, you know. I mean, as a record producer, obviously, you want to be bringing certain ideas to the party. And if you're working on something that doesn't inspire you or doesn't, you don't like, then you're not going to be able to do that. So first and foremost, yeah, it has to be uh, something that I particularly like musically, and often, uh, also importantly, there's got to be a singer on there that I, I, I like the, the sound of as well. You know, it's got to be a mm-hmm. vocal on there that I, I feel that I can connect with. Mm-hmm. And I've been very fortunate. I mean, over the years, I've worked with some great uh, vocalists, and um, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. You know, there's different types of producers, you know, some there's some producers that sit back and just give their action. There's some producers that get involved and play instruments or whatever. What, 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 what kind of producer would you say you are? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, sometimes I say, especially with modern day pop production, you've got a lot of producers who actually kind of co-write the song and basically tell the singer, sing this and do that. And so on. I'm not like that at all. Uh, I, I, again, alluding back to what I said earlier on, you know, um, you know, the engineer producers, you know, the people like Steve Liddy White and Martin Russian, you could, you know, you give them a project to work on and you know with their skills at the desk, they're going to give you a good sounding record. That was initially what I focused on. So for quite a long time, I didn't focus uh, on playing anything on most of the records I worked on. I was just too wrapped up in making sure that I was recording it correctly and focusing on the the sonic side of things. But as time goes on and being that I being that I can play, I mean, I'm not a great keyboard player by any imagination, but I can play bass fairly well and I can play rhythm guitar. There have been times when I've kind of like, you know, put something down and said, you know, I think this is what I can hear and I've tried it and it, and it stayed on the record, you know. Mm. So, um, you know, and, and obviously more so now with this new Bradford thing, where actually, again, I'm becoming like a performing member of the band. Um, so I do occasionally play on things. But um, but I would say for especially in the eighties and the early part of the nineties, I was mo- I was focusing mainly on making sure sonically everything sounded how it should be. But then also I would be talking to the band about arrangement ideas as well. You know, I'm always kind of I've always been one to try and think about okay, let's make sure this record, this record, especially if it's going to be a single, how are we going to start it? How are we going to make it so that within the first few bars, you know what that record is? You know, so things like that I'd be focusing focusing on and so on. Um, and so that comes, I guess, from more my musical knowledge. As I said, you know, the, the idea of production was always going to be a balance between the engineering and the musician side of my of my head. You mentioned Steve Lilly, Lillywhite, and he used to have a rule that he only did three albums with a band. And I know there's certain bands, um, for Blur, for example, that you've done a strain of albums with. Um, but how does it feel as a producer when you've worked with a band for so long and then you think you're going to be working on the next album and they go with someone else? Um, well, yeah, I can't deny it. It, 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 it is, um, I mean, you know, it's going to happen sooner or later, but it, it you know, it, it does hurt. I, I, I mm. mean, I always remember after we did, um, I did the Blur album, you know, the, I think that was the fifth one in the, yeah, it was the fifth one in the mm. kind of list of albums I'd done with them. And, uh, I, you know, um, I remember I went to a, an after show party in Brighton. Uh, the, the guys had done the tour for that album. Damon kind of took me to one side and said, we're going to be 
doing the next record with William Orbit. And I must admit, I did feel a bit, you know, I was like, oh, you know, a little bit mm -hmm. choked. But then again, thinking back, you know, it was, it was going to happen sooner or later. And I, I had a good run. I mean, when they did the Blow album, the fifth album, they obviously wanted to do something different from what they'd done before with the, you know, the Great Escape and Park Life and Modern Life is Rubbish. So, you know, that could have been the time for them to have changed producer. And they didn't. So really, you know, I counted myself lucky in some respects that I was able to be part of that new chapter with them. And mm -hmm. I, I look back on that very kind of, you know, fondly, really. Um, but yeah, it isn't, it isn't nice when, you know, an artist that you've developed a long-term relationship goes off and works with someone else, but such is the nature of the game, really. You know? Yeah. Well, when, when you're writing songs, when, when you're in the producer's chair with bands and they're writing songs, what do you think is more important, a great melody or a great lyric? I would say the melody, really, initially. Um, but if you can tie it in with a great lyric, I'll say in the game, I kept myself very lucky. I've worked with some amazing lyricists over, mm -hmm. over the years. Um, that uh, that is a double whammy when you get that. But I, I've got to admit, there's no point having just a fantastic bit of prose and then a, a real bad melody that doesn't sell it over the top of the song. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to have the melody as well. And so um, I, I, I would say the melody, you know, I, mm -hmm. I mean, everyone goes with the old the kind of kind of postman whistle it if they can, then, you know, you, you got a hit. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think, yeah, even Damon was probably would 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 agree that his lyrics on the earlier blur stuff was nothing like as good as the lyrics that he did later on in life, yeah. you know, and, and so and so, you know, I think, uh, yeah, the songs are really good. You know, I mean, there's no other way is is a great pop you know kind of indie pop single um so yeah that, yeah i think melody first but you know if you can get a, I, I do like a decent lyric as well if i can especially if i'm doing an album with an artist i couldn't i couldn't <laughs> i don't think i would enjoy making an album uh, full of uh, of badly written lyrics <laughs> so difficult absolutely i mean you've worked with some amazing artists over the over the years is there an artist or, or band around now that you would love to work with um this actually there's i mean there's lots of new things going around at the moment that are really really um you know exciting i mean it's just i like both uh, I, I, I love shame and um the fontaine's dc i think they're a great guitar yeah. band you know um uh I, in fact I, I had the good fortune to see both of them play live at the uh, Ken, uh kentish town forum i think fontaine's were supporting shame uh and they were taught shame with touring the first album uh i mean they're two that come spring to mind straight away and there's some, you know, kind of new things coming through. Uh, you know, young young bands. I've heard about a new band called Courting that I really like. Uh, I think Super Max played them. The only problem we've got at the moment is, is uh, that you know, obviously, guitar bands aren't selling as much, and streaming yeah. isn't really filling that gap. So, you know, we're not we're, we're, the record labels are not really giving people budgets to work work, work with. So you, you can everyone's kind of scrabbling around for scraps at the moment. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a shame. Mm -hmm. But there is still life in the guitar band, and I'm hoping that when there is a return to festivals and shows and gigs, you know, um, that that um, people, as well as buying tickets for those, actually start buying people's records again. It'd be useful, it'd be good because you know you can sell the ticket the tickets and uh, and you know for festivals in the world, but it doesn't help people on the recording side of the industry at all. And that's you know, and, and, and as a spokesman for producers and engineers and all the recording studios out there, they've really been suffering the last twenty years. Yeah, and it's not very healthy at the moment. The state of the recording industry is not in good shape. Yeah, all the all the good studios are disappearing, and yeah. people are making music from their bedrooms now. And yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, and what's happened because the bands now have suddenly realised that they can't. You know, the only way they were making money over the last ten years or so was playing every festival possible under the sun. You know, you'd see bands every weekend. And easy jet flights flying out to different parts of Europe to play gigs because that's the only way you know, festivals are cheap to play for bands because the, all the infrastructure is there going out and doing a tour on your own that's a lot more expensive and that's why bands are, are so at the moment suffering because the festival seasons are closed so the way of filling their pockets with some money from that is gone so they're having to rely on their music and they're looking at what they're getting from the streaming um, platforms and they're going well this doesn't add up as you yeah. know, it's been well publicised this last couple of weeks. So, yeah. um, but if it's if it's hitting artists like that, imagine what it's doing to all the producers and engineers who who rely on royalties from the records that they've made to to live because we don't get anything on ticket sales from festivals. Mm -hmm. So it's it's pretty tough for us too. And the whole industry, you know, as I say it was and and it still is, I guess, 
after America, it's we are the second biggest in the world when it comes to providing that kind of side of the industry, you know, the recording side mm -hmm. of the industry. But we've been forgotten about, really. Do you have an opinion on uh, or an idea of how streaming services such as Spotify could pay fairly to artists? Well, I think they've got to realise, think, do they really need to take their 30 plus whatever it is percent that they take? I mean, considering everything is just given to them on the plate, all they've got to do is provide the platform. I, mm -hmm. I agree they should take something. But you've got to ask yourselves, why if, if we are paying $9.99 for Spotify in the UK, why is, why is America only paying $9.99? dollars why is mm -hmm. europe only paying 9.99 euros surely if we're paying 9.99 pounds then they should be paying more and that little bit extra more might help to kind of pay the artists around the world you know i, I pay 15 pounds for spotify well would you pay for, for just what for for the family sort of Oh, for package. the family one. Yeah, I'm talking about individual though. Yeah, I'm yeah. Talking about the individual one. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the same as Apple. If you buy, it's it's like you know. And I do. I pay. I pay. Yeah, fourteen ninety nine. Where where it is, or fifteen ninety nine for uh, the family one, so that you know my my my, my offspring can can listen to it. But mm -hmm. as I say, it's there's certain things they could do, and also the record companies don't need to take such a big cut because mm -hmm. they're not actually manufacturing the records. They're not pressing up the the, the sleeves. They're not, you know. And again. You know, they should be looking at, hold on a minute, let's be a little bit fairer here to the artists. Yeah. And thereby being fair to the producers and the engineers who get paid for, can we get paid pro to whatever the artists get? So if the artists have got a shit deal, so do we. Mm -hmm. You know. I'll we'll talk about the, the Bradford album. Um, you said you signed Bradford to your label 30 years ago and you produced their de debut album. Yeah, yeah. And now, 30 years later, you joined the band for the album uh, Bright Hours. How did, how did that happen? Well, I, I always kind of kept an eye, an eye and an eye open for uh, the band. I always, I always loved, particularly Ian's lyrics, and he, he, uh, I always saw he was again he was a masterful songwriter. And when um, they, they got in touch with me a couple of years back, two, well, yeah, three, three or four years back now, they were looking for the tapes for the original album, uh, Shouting Quietly, that we had done because they found <clears> a. a label in Germany, Turntable Friends, who wanted to put out a, a reissue of the of the record. So I did that and it was nice to hear that I could you know, listen to it again. And I thought actually uh, there's some really good stuff here. But then you know I just didn't think about it anymore. And then uh Ewan got in touch with me and he sent me some recordings that he and Ian had done and with this kind of note saying, do you know anyone who could, we could approach to mix it? And I, I could tell between the lines really when he was asking me <laughs> we, we to mix it. But I kind of felt that really it, it needed more than mixing it. The, the songs weren't really quite, you know, brought truly fully to how it should. I mean, they were, they, were, you know, they were in good shape to a certain degree, but it needed a little bit more input on it. And uh, so I kind of thought, well, you know, why don't I kind of roll up the sleeves and get involved? So I went back to him and said, look, obviously you haven't got a budget for doing this, so you can't pay me. Mm -hmm. uh, but well, how about I join them as a member of the band and we do this as a joint venture you know we actually work together as team Bradford and make this make a new album so they were delighted with that idea and so that's what happened so I said to you know, to uh, you and just send me a, what you've worked on so far uh, I added and put things on that I felt were needed in, and then mixed it and um, I'm really pleased with it I think it's, it's really come together I think it's worked out to be uh, a fine, you know, updated Bradford album. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the, the public make of it. Well, I thoroughly been enjoying it. Um, I love the tracks, My Wet Face and Present Day Ray. They're, they're probably my two favourite tracks on it. Oh, great, cool. cool. But it's, it, it, it's quality the, the whole way through. Um, uh, what, do you have Do you have a favourite track on the album yourself? What, what did you enjoy working on or, or writing? Um, I sort of think. I think, well, Like Water was one that straight over. That was the very last one that we finished. And as the, the last one we did, and I, I always remember as I finished it, the, the final mix, I said, I phoned the boys and I said, look, I think, you know, this, we should go with this as the first single because it just seemed to sum up a new chapter for us. Mm -hmm. So that for me is a key one. Um, I, I, I really like uh, the weight, the weightlessness of the point that pointlessness is mm -hmm. a very, very long title. <laughs> the way, no, the, yeah, I didn't get that right. Hold on a minute. I always get that, that, that lyric wrong. The weightiness <laughs> of the pointlessness, isn't it? Yeah. I think, yeah. um, I think again, I, I just love the vibe of that. I, and 
Okay, the, Ian's playing with the lyrics. I mean, like, you know, My Wet Face is, is uh, I, I think he's, he, he's a fine, fine lyricist. And it was a real pleasure to hear his voice again coming through the speakers. And uh, it's been really good fun to work on it, as I say. Um, uh, um, I, I, I really think that it stands, you know, it stands up. I mean, if, 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 I, if I'd finished it and I didn't think it stood, stood because obviously, I've, you know, I've got a certain quality control that I, that I like to, you know, mm. keep. And if I didn't think it was worth it, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have agreed to have got involved. But I really did think it was worth getting involved. So yeah, I'm proud of it. Yeah. yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a slow. It was a slow burner. But I think all the best albums is. Well, that's it. That's the whole point. And this is the whole point, yeah. isn't it, Mark? It's like you know this thing about instant gratification. Everyone wants now. It's just one song. It's got to be the hit. It's got, that's not the same thing with the albums. You know, I mean, I've actually got into buying vinyl again recently. And we all know when you put on a, an album for the first time and listen through, the chance of you loving every single track straight away is minimal. Mm -hmm. But if you stick with it, the ones that didn't hit you straight away can actually end up being some, some, sometimes your favourite tracks, you know. Yeah, absolutely. sometimes it just takes like about 10 spins, or, you know, and then one day you're just like, yeah, that's that's a belter track. I love that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, it just seeps into the, into the skin. But you, you mentioned the, the, the debut album, Shouting Quietly, which was released in 1990 and, and you produced. Do you think it was just released at the wrong time? Because, you know, the whole bag Yeah, well, was there was a the double whammy time. there. I mean, because that, that was my label. So I was funding everything there. And we were, first of all, hit financially because Rough Trade Distribution, who were doing our distribution at the time, mm -hmm. um, they were going through a very tricky period. There was a bit of a recession at that point. Um, and, and the, the independent record industry was in a bit of a disarray. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were hit a bit financially. And then secondly, what happened was the, the rise of Madchester, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and sensitive kind of skinheads singing kind of songs about skin storm and, 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 and you know, doing what they were doing. Um, mm -hmm. I always thought, you know, if I was to kind of quickly summarise Bradford, I'd say the Smiths, bumping into Elvis Costello, you know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. And that suddenly became very unfashionable, you know, because mm -hmm. Manchester was all kind of looped grooves and, you know, baggy trousers and bowl haircuts and stuff. And it just wasn't what Bradford fitted into at all. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just unfortunate timing for them really. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think they realized that. And, and that's why unfortunately they decided to, to, uh, to call it a day. Um, and uh, so it was just, yeah, it was, it was, it was slightly poor, you know, an, an unfortunate timing. Well, it's great that they're back. As I say, it's a great album. But um, the songs do stand up still, don't they? I mean, you, just, yeah. you listen to Shouting, Shouting Quietly, there's some, there's some really good songs on there. I mean, Greed and Pleasant, uh, uh, Greed and Peasant Land, rather. I mean, what a fantastic play on words that came from Ian, you know, and again, the lyrics are fantastic. And he's up there with Weller. You know, it really is yeah. when it comes to, you know, social comments sometimes and, 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 uh, and his lyrics and, uh, and Billy Bragg and stuff. You know, he, he's, 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 he's a fine, fine lyricist. Why do you think he left it so long to do this record? Well, I think Ian, you know, must probably had to go off and get, make a living to try and do, you know, to try and get by. So he, he obviously yeah. had to focus on doing something else apart from music. Although mm -hmm. I gather he's always been in the band ever since, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you have to con confirm that with him. But as far as I know, he always did, did, he always did music on the side. So he was always a member of a band, whether it just been playing in a Clash covers band or whatever, you know, he was always doing something musically because that's in his blood. He, he can't stop it. He can't stop mm -hmm. himself. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, needs must, basically. And, and I guess, you know, everyone, if you can't make money from, from being a musician, you have to go and do something else. And that's what you had to do for a while. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, these days, there's so many people who are in bands who have normal jobs. Yeah, they have to, yeah. You know, it's crazy. Do you get the same pleasure from being work, working with Brad, Bradford and being part of the band as you do for doing your normal music production? Yeah, I do. It, for me, it's I don't really have to kind of dissect and really think about what is what, you know, and com 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 compartmentalise those things. I just do it, really. I mean, as I say, you know, the joy of like, you know, the, let's say the guy sent me a song and I'm listening to it, I think, oh, I think the bass should be doing this and picking up a bass guitar and playing and putting it on and going, yeah, that sounds great. And then, you know, finishing it, that is very satisfying, you know. Um, and because I've had, I've, I've, I've had to really deep uh, dig a bit deeper into my musical side of my knowledge to do that, that's kind of gratifying in that respect too. Because sometimes if I'm working with a band and they're, they're all great musicians and they're kind of, you know, it, that is what they are, then I don't have to get involved playing anything. All I've got to mm -hmm. worry about doing is the sonic side of things. So it has been 
quite gratifying to kind of you know dig into my musician my musical side mm -hmm. uh, of, 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 of myself as it were um but it, it comes quite natural i don't really kind of sit there and, and, and you know kind of think ruminate over it too much really mm -hmm. so excuse me for drinking my mouth gets very That's dry <laughs> i had a coffee before so i'm <laughs> and i just when i'm talking you know the mouth just always gets dry well i can't talk to you without obviously you mentioned some of the bands that you, you've uh, you've worked with and obviously the smiths is one of the most famous ones you've worked with how did you get get involved with the smiths um i was working at ireland when i was an in-house engineer and um Island records at that time although the studio most of the time was uh, was um, for the use of island artists as it were mm -hmm. uh, sometimes at the weekends they put on other sessions to get some money because they just they had invested in a new desk and they needed some you know some money coming in and um uh, my studio manager said to me there's a session that rough trader booked coming at the weekend uh the band's called the smiths can you do it and i was like yeah because i was already aware of them um they'd been on top of the pops doing this charming man only literally a week or two before and so I just made sure uh, they came in that session um, with John Porter uh, and we did have a nose and miserable now. So that was the very first session I ever worked on with them as an engineer. And um, I think we did Girl Afraid as well. Um, and we basically, I just made sure I just went out of my way to be as, you know, uh, as impressive as I could possibly be and as helpful mm. as I could possibly be. And I think it kind of showed and, and they took my name and number. Um, they said be, they'd be in touch. The next single they did was William was really nothing and they didn't use me and they did it in a different mm. studio. So I kind of thought, okay, well that, that ship has uh, sailed and it's gone, you know. But um, fortunately, uh, shortly after that, Jeff Travis called and said, look, the band want to do the next album. Mm. Uh, they want to produce it themselves, but work with an engineer that they like and trust. Will you be up for it? So that was it. So that was a real kind of that was the real major start of my relationship with them when we did meet as murder. One of my favorite tracks is "There Is Light That Never Goes Out." You know, of all time. What can mm -hmm. you tell me about working on that track? That was just a dream to work on. That was, uh, as you know, as I say, from the Queenie's Dead album. The majority of that album was recorded at a residential studio in Farnham called Jacobs, and. I remember uh, working one afternoon in particular with Johnny. We'd had the bass and the drums and the, the main rhythm guitar down. On, and, and I think Morrissey had put a vocal down. And we'd hired this um, emulator, which is like a sampler thing, which was kind of new for the Smiths to start using kind of keyboards on the records, because up to that point, pretty much everything. It was a bit of organ on the first album, but most of the, most of the time it's, you know, guitars. But uh, I always remember working with Johnny uh, uh, on the overdubs that afternoon, uh, you know, the little flute lines and the little string parts and so on. And, you know, um, and it just seemed that everything we tried worked, every single little element. And I just remember it being one of those magical sessions where and then we, it, everything just clicked. And, our, you know, listening back to it with Johnny at the end of the uh, end of the day and listening to it, okay, we've done something pretty you know, special here. This is this is really good. Mm -hmm. And um, I just always will remember you know, when Morrissey did his vocal for it, you know, the, the lyrics just really stuck in my brain straight yeah. away. I just thought this this guy is on a different planet. You know, uh, it's just the quality of the lyric is just is absolutely stunning. The emotion of it, you know, but expressed through, you know, the simplicity of, you know, saying uh, to die by your side, you know, you know, it's just it, the pleasure and privilege is mine. It's just it's a sad thing, but it's also glorious at the same time, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's just, uh, just, um, I was blown away by it, as, as I think Johnny was too, because I don't think Johnny had heard the lyric for that song before we recorded it. This was around about the time when some of the songs that Johnny uh, Morrissey had written, uh, Johnny hadn't heard what Morrissey was going to sing mm -hmm. before we actually got in the studio. So it was new for him as well when he heard the, you know, the vocals go down. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, a great song, and it, and it still stands the test of time, I think, you know, it still sounds fresh. As you say, the lyrics are amazing, but they're, when you first hear them, they're so unusual, yeah. you know, but they're fantastic. And, and the last album, the Smith's last album, Strange Ways, that you worked on as, as well, um, I think, personally, I think it's, it's, it's their best album. Um, I do too, I do, I agree. So does Johnny, apparently. Yeah, but he, he left, that's when he left. I mean, when he, when he left, after that 
did you think he was going to come back or was it yeah. going to be a, a temporary? Yeah, I, 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 I was, I was absolutely ninety percent sure that, that this was just a little tiff, a little argument. They'd sort out all the management problems because that's the reason why Johnny left. He was just fed up not having a manager, you know, because mm-hmm. Moriarty is kind of unfortunately pretty unmanageable in, in some respects and yeah. you could never find a manager that he trusted but as johnny was saying like, i need a manager I'm f- i just want to be the guitar player in the band i don't want to be taking on all this responsibility of you know all this bullshit so anyway i i i just thought that um that they, they would be back together again and, and and certainly when i submitted my kind of song ideas to morrissey I was only doing it on, uh, because I knew when we finished Strange Race, there wasn't really much left in the can for the B-sides of the singles. So I I was just trying to go, look, here's some ideas. If you think it could be a B-side, you know, please, you know, I was trying just to kind of keep the the ship moving, mm-hmm. you know, kind of keep the, the stone rolling where everyone, uh, you know. Where, where. I just I just never thought that that would be the start of Morrissey's solo career and the Smiths would be over. And even when we done Fever yeah. Hate, I really thought that after a year or two, Johnny would Morrissey would be back together again. Yeah. But I think what complicated everything was the, the court case. You know, it soured everything. And I think that's the reason that's probably, you go back to it. I think that's most probably the, the, the main reason why they've not been able to, you know, bury the hatchet as it were and reform. Although I can't remember whose book it was, it was either Johnny's or Morrissey's that said that they actually did meet up in a pub one day and did discuss getting back together. Yeah, I think they have met occasionally over the years. Mm-hmm. But then again, so I think Johnny and Morrissey, as they've grown up, they've kind of grown apart, you know? Mm-hmm. I, think, um, I think, you know, I, I think there was a time it could have perhaps worked, but I think perhaps that moment has passed now. Yeah. You know? And what do you think of the both Johnny and Morrissey's recent solo work? Are you a fan? Um, I think actually Morrissey's last album was quite bold in the sense that it was it was doing things that I hadn't actually heard him try and do before, which I thought was quite a, 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 a bold move. Mm-hmm. Um, and Johnny's, I think his last record is is his best. He's, he's yeah. not, I thought it was really I thought some really good moments on that. Uh, you know, um, so you know they're both they're both doing. A lot of great work. I mean, like everyone, I'd love to see what they could do together again. I really would do, you know. Um, I would like to see them think about coming back to the UK and making a record here. I still think that, that he, making his records as he does outside of the UK puts a certain flavour on them that I don't think is quite as good as the ones he's done when he's recorded here in the UK, to be honest. Mm-hmm. With that. I can't put my finger on exactly why. Um, and it's not just me saying, oh, I could do a better job, but I don't know. There are certain thick flavours and things that to what he does. That I think, oh, I'm not sure about that. But but I'm going to get too critical because I know certainly that I, I've got a lot of respect for both Johnny and Morrissey, and I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for them. They were mm-hmm. a very big reason why I got a, a big you know, step on the ladder um, mm-hmm. at a certain point in my career, which every young person needs when they, when they start in this industry. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I'm not going to sit here and pick holes in their work, but uh, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think I've answered that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I loved, I loved the last Marcy album. I thought it was one of his best in a long time. Yeah, yeah, I think there was some some bold movement, yeah, bold, bold kind of uh, you know moves on it. Yeah, it was great. As, as I said at the start, my first introduction to who you were, and obviously Blur as well, was uh, your production work on There's No Other Way, which is it still stands the test of time. It's a tr- tremendous record. Um, what, what can you tell me about that? You know, because it has the, the baggy drum beat and stuff like that there. Was that all in there intact at the start from the demo? There was a, a bit of that. I mean, there was no doubt. I mean, you know, as we, uh, the Stone Roses were everywhere uh, at that point. You know, the influence of the Stone Roses and that kind of slightly baggyish groove was um, was prevalent in the industry, wasn't it? You know, everyone mm-hmm. was kind of getting into that groove. It was there on the original demo to a certain degree, although I kind of brought that out even more. Um, there's a story here, right? So, Run DMC had sampled Fool's Gold for a Run DMC single. Yeah. And they added right? some extra kind of oomph to it, some um, bass end kind of kick thing. And I sampled that 
So Stone Roses was sampled by Run DMC, which I then sampled and used an element of it, just the bottom end of it. And then Dave played his drums on top. So there's an underlying element of groove that was sampled off a of Run DMC right. record that's in there as well. Uh, but then Dave supplies all those lovely drum fills, you know, in, in, you know, in each of the pauses that happens throughout the song and stuff. But so it's a mixture of Dave playing his groove on top of a groove of run DMC sampling the Stone Roses. So it's kind of once removed. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, so that's the story I'm not sure people know. No. But anyway, it was just uh, it was it was very subtly done. So it was just kind of, you know, it was just really more for the bottom end of, 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 of the track. But the guys could replay and Graham's guitar. I mean, I always remember that was the very first session I ever did with them. Once I, I remember him plugging in. And back in those days, Graham wouldn't play in the control room. He'd always go, he, he was too shy to sit next to me in the control room, which, which we did mm. later on, you know, as time went on, he would always go and sit by his amp and, you know, and do his thing there. And I just remember hearing him play and the dexterity of his fingers, you know, I, I always remember that that riff, the way it just seemed to flow out of him. And I just thought, this guy is special. This guy is really, really good. And of mm. course, you know, that started a very long working relationship. And I've made more record, records with Graham than I have with, with any of, of the other artists in my life, you know, because as well as the Blur stuff, there's the solo stuff, there's yeah. the Pete Doherty solo record that he played on. So you know, me and Graham have uh, been side by side in quite a few sessions over the years, and I, I, I love him. I mean, what a player. Incredible, incredible guitar. Yeah, player. he's tr tremendous. Um, is it true you recorded Girls and Boys without the record company's permission? Because it wasn't yeah, I mean, budget. That, that was, yeah, I mean, what happened was back in those days when we did, and this is by the time we were on Park Life, still what would happen was the band would do demos and the record company would go, okay, we want you to do that one and that one and that one with Stephen. So they would kind of pick the ones that we wanted to focus on. Anyway, we were in the studio and we'd done some work already on the, some of the Park Life tracks. And Damon played me this little kind of home demo that he'd done with a rinky dinky kind of you know drum machine and him kind of singing the band said they had been playing it but i, I certainly had not heard i i i never heard them play the song all i heard was this very basic demo but i really liked it i thought the chorus was just like you know it was so straightforward it was just it was it was it was kind of sticking your brain and no no doubt about it so I said, look, let's do this, let's do this rather than the band just going and trying to play it. Why don't we build this up like a kind of 120 BPM disco record? You know, let's just think differently for this one. So we programmed up the, the synthesized bass line and drum machine pattern. And then Alex and Dave played on top of that. So Alex kind of got his, into his Duran Duran, you know, John Taylor kind of... <laughs> disco line and they just did a very simplistic thing on top just to kind of give it a little bit of extra life but when once graham put his kind of you know guitar sweeps all over the top of that phasey guitar sound and everything and then you know it, it just sounded like blur straight away and, and it was really exciting we did it pretty much in one afternoon it was really you know great so the next day i get a phone call from andy ross uh, from um food records you know the label that they're on and he was asking how it's going. And I said, Andy, well, by the way, yesterday we did a really good song called Girls and Boys. You're going to love it. And he was a bit like, a, <clears throat> uh, you've not been asked to do that one, Stephen. Because uh, I think they were, I think that's probably they all thinking about doing it with, with a producer that was more dance oriented, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? I said, well, we've done it, Andy. I said, and I think you're going to like it. So, you know, and fortunately they did. So, yeah, that was uh, that was it. So yeah, it's true. I wasn't really originally in that. I don't think uh, the, the person they had in mind to do it, but I did it anyway, and it paid off. The rest is history. You produced all the Blur albums apart from Thirteen and Think Tank until a few years ago when you did the Magic Whip. What was it like when you received the phone call from Graham saying, you know, uh, I this. think I had a, 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 a grin from ear to ear. I was so excited. I hadn't been in touch with the boys. If you can imagine now, then. The band, the last record I'd done with them was Blur, so that was 1996. This was 2014, I think, uh, they, they first approached me. Um, so I was really delighted, but, you know, but I was aware that it was a project that might not get anywhere because Graham made it quite clear that Damon had kind of lost interest in it. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they had done this recording They've been, they, they were stuck in Hong Kong for a week, so I thought rather than do nothing, let's just jam in a little studio and see what comes about. 
And then Damon had brought the, the song files back to the UK, done a little bit of work on them, but then now, um, you know, he was too busy with gorillas and other projects he was working on and just lost the interest in it. So Graham went to him and said, look, can, can, do you mind if I take these away and see if there's anything, you know, in it that I can, you know, I can do? And Damon said to him, who, who are you going to do it with? And Graham said, well, I would like to get Stephen involved. So Damon said, yeah, okay, fine. And, and left it, you know, left Graham up to it. So basically Graham sent me the files. I said to him, look, I want to sit there. I don't want any pressure. I want to better listen through to it without anyone sitting over my shoulder and just go through it. So I'm hearing it, you know, like as, as like the first set of public ears, like, you know, mm -hmm. and say, and then be able to do what I think, what I would do with it if I was working with them, you know, and they were playing me sessions in the room. So I would do edits and things and do what I feel was right. I said, and then I said to Graham, once I've done that, then can you come in and then we'll start working together and you do all your guitar things that you're going to do on it and so on and keyboard. Because Graham, Graham actually does play a fair bit of keyboards on the record in the end. Mm -hmm. So basically we did that and we just saw, well, so we're working with these kind of scratch vocals that Damon had done. Uh, 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 some have been worked on a little bit more than others, but some of them were very, very basic, just like literally vocals that come off his iPad. Because Damon uh, does all these demos on Garage Band on iPad. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. He, he, he doesn't. That's what I love about him. You know, he doesn't have a big plush studio to do his demos. He just yeah. does his demos are done on an iPad. And. Um, so that was it really. Graham and I were left to our de own devices for about three weeks. We kind of chipped away at it, did everything we thought we could do so that we could then present it back to Damon and say to Damon, Damon, this is what we think we've got <laughs> as an mm -hmm. album, have a listen. And I always remember we went back to 13, which is Damon's studio and Graham and I sat there kind of playing in what we'd done so far. And we were both nervous. We thought, cause this, mm -hmm. is, this is either gonna be, it's gonna go great, I love it, or I'm not feeling it. Fortunately, mm -hmm. loved it, mm -hmm. and so uh, and that was it. So and then and then Damon said to me, you know, like, should I just take it and finish it off? And I said to him, well, I want to see it through now. Now that I've started as a producer, I'm you know working with you on it. I, I want to work with you again as a vocalist, and you know, and produce. You know, as you're doing your vocal takes, I want to be there because I think that's a big part of record production. I really do. Yeah. Is, you know, recording the vocalist, it's a big part of it. So uh, he said, fine. So I hadn't worked with him since 1996. And there we are working together. This is a guy who's had, you know, huge hits with gorillas and stuff. Mind you, I don't, I've had some hits as well in between. But still, you know, Dame was quite a strong minded character. You know, I wasn't sure how it was going to work. But we got on like that. It was just like going back to the old days. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. we, we clicked. We had a wonderful session. We got all his work done in a couple of weeks. Uh, he's, you know, he worked like a Trojan. He, he, he went off to Hong Kong to work in between. The session, you know, the, the session where Graham and I had played him the ideas. Mm -hmm. He'd gone back to Hong Kong to do, you know, to get inspired and write his lyrics. And um, we had a great session. It was fantastic. Everything just clicked into place, and and, and I'm very proud of that Magic Rip, Magic Rip album. I mean, you consider it could have been an album that was never made. Yeah, I think it, I think it stands up. You know, it, it works really well. It's a it's a great record, and hopefully somewhere down the line there'll be another one. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, never know. I mean, I'm not counting my chickens, but you know, yeah. you never know. What what would be your favorite Blur album that you've worked on? I still think it's the Blur album, the Blur Blur album. I just right. think it was a brave record because the band needed to do something to kind of keep their keep them interested in in themselves, you know. And it could have backfired awfully, you know, this kind of willfully going more kind of lo-fi kind of whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. after the kind of the, the kind of the pop sheen of, of, of the great escape you know whatever but I think it was it, it needed to be done and we did it and we did it boldly and we did it well and I think it stands up I really do I think it's a great record you know and, and Beastful Bum still sends a shiver down my spine every time I hear that yeah and um it's just some great moments on there you know um so that for me is it's still my fa personal favorite one and probably their most famous track song too. Yeah, I mean it's funny, isn't it? I mean, well, I, I guess I guess really because that's the only song America ever really took to, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. And that being the biggest market in the world, it obviously it makes it makes a difference. But what's again? That was a fantastic song that just clicked into place one afternoon. You know, we were just having fun with that. You know, it was the the punky one or one of the punky ones on the album. You know, and and and, and it ended up being a smash hit. So. 
Mm. There's a band being free and playing, and, and it comes over, I think, in the music. It was just them you know, having, a, having a great time and, and just really enjoying that kind of dynamic of really letting go. It was good. Yeah, uh, I think it was a, a record that they really had to do after the trilogy previous, you know, which was very English yeah. and, you know, yeah. uh, which were great records, you know. You were brought in to see of the, the Suede album, uh, A New Morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Personally, I, I, I like the album. There were some great tracks, yeah, Obsessions, Beautiful Loser, and, and, and Brad Anderson said you, you turned it around. But it didn't, it didn't seem to click that album with, with, with the, the public and, and, and the band, you know, split up not long afterwards. Uh, where do you think that was? Because it was a strong set of songs. What, what was your opinion about the album? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I, I, I didn't want to get involved in any kind of suede versus blur wars thing. I always yeah. put suede a lot of credit for starting, most probably the beginning of the Britpop thing. You know, I mean, Britpop became a dirty word, but, you know, I think Britpop was a great movement. It was a great, you know, instead of having Tina Turner and, and, and you know, Phil Collins and the Eurythmics dominating the charts, we had some great guitar bands dominating the charts, you know, young people again, you know, and it was, it was wonderful for that. And I think Suede, that, that you know, that, that, the, 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 the opening kind of salvo of the Suede singles was fantastic. That really did kickstart things. It certainly gave Damon to kick up the arse, you know, we know that, you know, you know, that's, that's why Modern Life is Rubbish happened, because it was like, yeah. hold on, you know, there's something happening here back in the UK. And, and, and so, but to get back to the Suede album, I always, as I said, always respected Suede uh, from afar. You know, obviously I was in the Blur camp, so yeah. I, I wasn't, you know. But I, I, I always loved their records. And um, so when they gave me the phone call to ask, find out if I'd be interested, I, I jumped at the chance. Um, I really enjoyed working with them on that record. I think, yeah, like you, I think Obsessions is a great track. Right. I think, you know, it stands up really well. But it, is, it was evident to me, I think at the time, I think the... the, the, the the, one of the things, the keyboard player on that album, I've forgotten his name now, forgive me, but it's not Neil. Neil, so. Neil oh, yeah, they brought on someone else. Neil was second. Yeah, and for me, I could tell that I, 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 don't, I don't think that 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 um, he fitted in as comfortably as Neil obviously does with the band. Yeah. There was something, there were, the, the chemistry wasn't there. I got on really great with, with Matt and, and um, is it the drummer, it's... Um, God, Simon, so it's Simon. Simon, that's it. great, you know. And I re and I was really trying to pull because what what was evident, I think, on some of the records they had done just previous to that was that Simon's live drums were getting a little bit too replaced with too much programming to some respects. You know, I wanted to kind of really get Simon playing it, and he really mm -hmm. loved that. He really, you know, jumped at the chance of playing his drums properly again. And I got on great with Matt. I still do, I and mean, you know, we kind of conf you know we sometimes con converse by. Uh, you know, Twitter and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I just felt that the, the chemistry in the band wasn't quite as comfortable, you know? And um, I just think that there was something there that, yeah, I, I think, I think there was, I think they were, they were, they were just dabbling at trying to make a sway record. I, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, it was just a, they were able to do it better the next time round. You know, they split mm -hmm. up for a while, didn't they, after that? And and then and obviously they went back in with the original producer. Uh, you know, I've forgotten his name now. Ed Buller. Ed Buller. How yeah. could I forget? Ed was my assistant <laughs> once. Was he? <laughs> yeah, Ed, that's it. Sorry, no, I'm just brain wall. I'm sorry. Too early in the morning. Uh, yeah, it is. I need another coffee. Ed, Ed's a lovely guy. In fact, he was my assistant at Iron Records. So that's a, that's another little bit of a kind of isn't the world strange how it all yeah. interconnects. So, um, but you know, at the time when we did Sway Record, I thought, yeah, it's really, really good. But I just don't know whether the public were really that interested in them at that point. You know, it was just one of those sad things. And, and uh, again, it just might be timing. But this, you know, it has its moments. But yeah. I, th I think it's probably. There was, I think it was a little bit, they'd been already through making those, uh, they'd been in the studio with Tony Hoffa making um, this album, you know, The New Morning. And I, to be honest with you, I think they just overthought it all. It was all mm -hmm. a, bit, a bit tired of it. I think I think some of the initial enthusiasm that a band would have when they're going to make a record have been slightly burnt out, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's my thoughts on it. George Martin said he was so lucky to have met the Beatles and worked with the Beatles. 
which band that you've worked with do you think you've been really lucky to work with? He says he was lucky to work with the Beatles. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, as I said uh, earlier on, uh, I've just kept myself very lucky I work with the Smiths, you know. Mm. Um, you know, every young engineer, producer <laughs> needs that first big break. And if you have a big break with a band that actually do go on to become, they might not have been the most commercially successful band of all time, but certainly something that stands the test of time, you know, very well. Um, you know, it could have been a very different story for me if I hadn't done that session, definitely. So I do, and I always respect Morrissey and Mar for giving me the, the opportunity that they did. Um, you know, you need a bit of luck in, you know, in, in, your, in, your, in your life. Although having said that, you, you, you can work at, you know, they do say the harder you, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah. So you've got to make the right decisions as well. And you've got to, when the opportunities do come your way, you've got to really make sure you, you, you grasp that chance and work as hard as you can. But um, yeah, I, without a doubt, without a doubt. And then, I mean, and then thereafter, obviously, blur. But you know, a band that everyone <laughs> tends to forget about that I work with, and no one, and it's, I, I don't know whether it's an, an English, Irish thing, but everyone forgets about the Cranberries. I mean, the Cranberries, no, you know, for me, true. Uh, globally, the biggest act that I've ever worked with, you know, ever. And, yeah. you know, I, I still stand by the records I made with them too. You know, I, I'm really proud of it, especially that very first album. I think it's a great record. Yeah, and uh, the yeah. such an amazing voice. Yeah. You know, but with, with only so much time, I was actually going to ask you about, I mean, there's so many bands I could ask you, ask you about, you know, it's amazing. Uh, and it's just such a pity um, that the Lords is no longer with us. But you did finish off uh, the record. Was it come out last year? Uh, yeah, yeah. So again, this was another one. Uh, well, I say another one. It was another one in the sense that it wasn't, you know, like like Magic Whip. It wasn't the usual thing of going in the studio and starting from scratch. This was a, sesh, a, a situation where, after Dolores had died, Noel had got in touch with me. He'd been working on sending demos backwards and forwards between New York, where she was living, and him in, 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 in Ireland and they'd been doing some work and she'd done some vocals and things and she had also been demoing stuff in America with some session musicians as well because she was always kind of doing she, she, when she was writing she, sometimes she wasn't sure whether it was going to be for her solo stuff or for you know, Kramis whatever so she was doing some demos on her own and she was also working on demos with Noel and uh, what happened was the management of the band contacted me and said, look, can you have a listen through and see if there's anything here that you feel would be, you know, suitable for, for finishing up as an album, Cranberry's album. Mm -hmm. So again, the same thing, I, I kind of said to Noel, look, really, what we don't want to be accused of is scraping the barrel. Mm -hmm. if, if we listen to this and we're not happy with it, we've just got to turn around and say, not going to touch it, you know, whatever, you know. So anyway, I listened through, as I said to them, again, send me everything that you've got and then I'll, I will, I'll see what I can do with it. And then once I'm happy with what I think is the correct songs to work on and focus on, mm -hmm. then the boys would come over and we would then work on top of that. So that's what happened, basically. They sent me everything. I um, Some things were just literally like little sketches with one verse and one chorus. So I'd have mm -hmm. to kind of try and hunt through and find alternative vocal takes and things and try and you know, make it a fuller song, or whatever, or add on another verse or whatever. Um, it was quite, it was, I mean, it's the kind of thing you could only do nowadays with Pro Tools and editing, you know, where yeah. you can copy and paste and move things around because it would have been impossible to have done it in the days of tape. Um, and that's what happened, basically. So I got hold of, uh, discarded the things I thought weren't, uh, weren't right or whatever, or just, just weren't quite, you know, quality control weren't, wasn't good enough. Uh, and then the boys came over and it was it was really touching actually because for them you know it was, it, it, uh, Dolores has died and she's gone but I was literally playing them like the, the click track of the demo with her vocal on it and they were playing to that so they were hearing her voice again and mm -hmm. we were hearing it control and it was quite quite an emotional kind of thing I think at first initially it was quite difficult and um and they did great you know we that we did a two-week session where they just played their hearts out on top of all these songs so they became proper cranberry songs you know it was it was the four members of the band playing on it and then uh yeah finished it and mixed it and i was really happy with it so i thought yes this does 
it's you know it does sound like it it's worth releasing so that was mm. it and that's what we, we gave back to the record company and so this is it this is how we see it and that's what came out yeah it was a great album one more question okay out of all the music in your collection which artist or band do you have the most albums by uh, in my collection, I think it would be Bowie. Right. Uh, yeah, it would be Bowie, I think. A drop of a hat. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, that's it. I mean, my first record I ever bought with my own pocket money was Ziggy Stardust and Spiders from Mars. I think mm -hmm. it was 12 years old, uh, 1972. And I still got it. Cherish it. It's on my uh, vinyl shelf around the back there, around the mm -hmm. corner. And... Uh, and, and, you know, God bless him. I miss the man greatly. Um, I still love all his work. And, um, yeah, that's, 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 again, if it wasn't for Bowie, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, I'm sure. Because it was him, really, and Mick Ronson, uh, also, I would say, that kind of got me into the idea of picking up a guitar in the first place. Yeah. A bit of Poland as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the connection with Mick Ronson because Morrissey went on to work with yeah, well, Mick I mean, Ronson we, as well. Morrissey and I, the same generation, we were both Bowieites, you know, and mm -hmm. both, you know, so I think, I think, I think, I think Mick Ronson did a great job on your arsenal. I think it's a fantastic yeah. album. Um, and, and I think Morrissey would have carried on working with him, as probably, if Mick hadn't sadly passed away. Mm -hmm. Well, Stephen, that's all my questions finished. Uh, I really, okay. really appreciate your time. I really, really enjoyed the chat. Cool, great, nice one. Talk longer um, about everybody you, you've worked with, you know, but it, it's been a pleasure talking to you and I've always wanted to talk to you. You know, you yeah, made great. someone. I'm sorry if I got a bit tongue tied and a bit and gabbled a bit in a few spots, but I'm no, sure. No, no, no. It was all, all quality <laughs> information there, you know. No, appreciate that. And listen, the best of luck with a record as well. I really, really am enjoying it. Cool. The, the nice Bradford one. record. Nice great stuff. Hopefully, there'll be more. Yeah, I think we're going to, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, kind of getting involved in, in some new recordings in the, in the in the coming year so yeah hopefully it will be yeah okay cool well, listen, nice Stephen enjoy the rest of your day mate take it okay, easy mate. have a good day see you, you later bye bye Cheers. bye bye